Hello, guys. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Upbeat Dietitians podcast. We have a returning guest today. We are joined by Kara Harpstreet. We had her on episode 54, so major throwback there. We talked about way back then um, intuitive eating and sports nutrition, and today we are completely kind of doing a 180, I would say, and talking about MSG. Um, we would consider Kara the CEO of MSG. If you follow her on social media, you'd likely agree. Um, so we are getting into that today with her. And just to give you a quick refresher of who Kara is, Kara is based in Kansas City and works in private practice and nutrition communications. She's a former athlete and still enjoys running, lifting, and outdoor activities whenever she gets a chance. Her work focuses on non-diet messaging, which is often featured in national media outlets and through brand partnerships. She also works one-on-one with clients for intuitive eating, eating disorder recovery eating disorder recovery, and sports nutrition. We're so excited for this episode, and we can't wait for you to listen. Enjoy. (laughs) Kara, welcome back to the Upbeat Dietitians podcast. Hello. Thanks for having me back. We are so excited to have you back. We are going into MSG today, which Emily and I have kind of coined you as the CEO of MSG. So we know you'll have some great info for us, but Remind our listeners who either haven't heard you before on the podcast or are brand new here, a day in the life for you, what you do for work, hobbies, all that good stuff. Well, a uh, significant portion of my work now is content creation on social media, which is where you'll find me talking about MSG literally all the time. But outside of that, I am still working as a dietitian. So very limited private practice at this point. Day to day is always really, really different. But for the most part, you'll find me either in the kitchen working on recipe development or video content. I do a lot of copywriting, both for my own blog and my own platforms, as well as on behalf of clients. Um, And we're about to head into a travel season. So my day to day is about to get even more irregular, we'll say, you know, traveling for conferences and other events like that. So I'm definitely not a creature of habit when it comes to a daily routine, but it's all really exciting. And it all has everything to do with delicious food, which is awesome. And you can't, I feel like it's tough to get sick when sick of delicious food which is good. Yes. I mean, that's probably one of the, I guess, hidden benefits. Like, yes, I do have to clean the kitchen multiple times any day that I'm cooking, but the payoff is meal prep gets done and we have many, many things to munch on. Can't complain. Well, we are so happy you are doing well and we have you back on. So let's jump right into it and talk about MSG and First and foremost, we just have to kind of get it out of the way because people might have heard about MSG. I'm sure they've heard rumors about MSG, but just to start us off, what exactly is MSG? Good question. And I agree, super important to start with because we hear that acronym MSG and it never fails. Whenever I post about this, someone chimes in and they're like, oh, Madison Square Gardens. And it's like, no, no, no. We're talking about monosodium glutamate. So that's what the MSG is referring to. And it's a rather simple molecular structure, especially when we consider, you know, how big and complex, you know, big, relatively speaking, other molecules in the body or our food can be. So that monosodium refers to just a single sodium molecule. And then the glutamate refers to the amino acid glutamate. So when that single sodium hooks up with that glutamate molecule, all of a sudden, boom, we have our MSG. But despite the relative simplicity of what that molecular structure is, it actually contributes a lot of flavor. So you might hear it referred to as umami. You know, that's what it's originally known for. That's a very savory flavor. One of the five basic tastes that our tongues are able to to detect and pick up on. And in food, it's both naturally occurring or can be added through either processing or cooking. So there's a number of ways that we actually get it in our diet, but the, you know, very, very shortened version of what it is. It's just that single sodium attached to a glutamate. I feel like uh, I'm glad you defined it as that because I feel like it's like almost like we're probably jumping a little bit ahead, but like perceived as this very scary, complex thing that is just 
going around. Um, yeah, I think but- it really goes back to that recommendation, you know, the very like diety thought of, oh, well, if you can't pronounce it, it should be avoided or it's unsafe, it's unhealthy. That perception, when we start getting into like very scientific um, labels or names for these different molecules, I admit like it is intimidating if you don't have that scientific background or, you know, it's been a while since you've taken a chemistry course, which I think for most people is true. You know, it really does get a little bit intimidating. And then of course, you know, there's all this debate about ingredients in general, food can be a very loaded topic, but I tell people, you know, if you're imagining some kind of you know, toxic poisonous powder, like that idea is, is really outdated. And when you look at it, it is a crystallized white powder, but from a distance, it's going to look very, very similar to the table salt that's in your salt shaker or the white granulated sugar that you might bake with or add to your coffee. So when we think about the substance itself, like the physical presence and appearance of it, we have crystallized white powders all over our kitchen. Like why can't MSG be just as normalized and just as embraced for the flavor that it can give our food? Yes, totally. Well, that's a good segue. So it does exist like in that powdery form. And I'm guessing in that way we can, you know, put it in our dishes ourselves and we'll go over at the end today. Um, if it's cool with you, Kara, some uh, like ways to use that practically, if you are kind of new to that, but tell us or tell our listeners rather like what types of foods tend to have MSG? Like what are the most popular foods that either naturally contain it or is it added to like in processing? Sure. Yeah. Let's start with the natural ones because I mean, those are some of the favorites we're recording this right at the end of summertime. And one of them is tomatoes. I see them all over social media. People are cooking with them, but even when they're not in season as a fresh tomato, you're going to find it in your tomato paste, your tomato sauce, you know, anything that's made from that tomatoes are a really high source. Um, of naturally occurring glutamate. You'll also find it in mushrooms, which is another favorite. That's why in a lot of vegetarian or vegan or plant-based dishes, that mushroom kind of serves as a meat substitute. It's not just a textural thing, right? Like it's also the savoriness, kind of the mouthfeel of it, which is again, coming from that glutamate. And then anything that has um, kind of that savory umami flavor, you can think of like a Parmesan cheese, other aged cheeses that kind of have that like a little bit of funk to it. You can't quite place it. It's not exactly salty, but it's not exactly, you know, bitter, sour, or sweet either. It's really described, you know, if you trace back to the history of when it was originally identified and and isolated to be produced as an ingredient, um, they would call it the essence of deliciousness, which I just love because it is really kind of difficult to describe it without experiencing it firsthand. Like, it's just a flavor enhancer. Whatever you're already tasting in your food, it's going to make it taste that much more intense or that much better. Then when it comes to, you know, some of the foods that you'll find it added to, a lot of people think immediately of Doritos. That always comes up in my comments when someone is like, oh, you know, don't you like Doritos? Don't you like some of these packaged snack foods that have, again, like this very savory component to them? So those are some common ones, but, you know, at this point, really anything that has that glutamate component with either sodium added, we can't really prevent those two from combining, you know, either as we're chewing, once we're, you know, digesting all of that. So I tell people, you know, this idea that it's found in only certain foods and others is kind of a misnomer because even when you're cooking from scratch at home and you have a high level of control over the individual ingredients you're using, Again, it's all going to the same place. So that glutamate is inevitably going to seek out that sodium, pair up, form that molecule to be then digested and broken down with the rest of our food. I never thought about how it can get combined like during like the chewing process. I like, I feel like we think of like, or we as in myself, (laughs) think of like, oh, the way it's added, how it's naturally like occurring in food. Um, but like, actually, like when you're eating it, like the combination of the amino acid and like the sodium molecule, or I feel like that can be very easy to combine the two, like in a lot of different dishes. Oh and- yeah. And this is not at all exclusive to MSG either. I mean, we have yeah. our mechanical digestion, which is the act of chewing, right? Like mechanically breaking down our food into smaller and smaller pieces 
we swallow it. It kind of gets churned around in our stomach. That's that again, mechanical digestion, but then we also have chemical digestion. So we have, um, lots of enzymes in our saliva, those gastric acids, that very acidic environment of the stomach and the GI tract, you know, those are also contributing to this breakdown of anything in our food, whether it's a sodium molecule, glutamate, or another amino acid, you know, we have a lot of again, relatively large and complex structures, and they're not all ready to just be absorbed in the small intestine and put straight to work. Like the body has to put a little effort in to do that. So that's another way I kind of reassure folks that this is something that they can enjoy and use if they want to, because it's no different than adding a spice or a seasoning or anything else to your food, because Again, it's all going to the same place. We at that point have no more control over keeping those individual molecules separated. Yeah. It's going to the same place <laughs> and your body will digest it just fine. So I feel like we've kind of hinted at the like this next part a little bit, but this will probably be one of the juiciest parts because MSG. I wouldn't say it's public enemy number one, but it gets a lot of unnecessary hate. So what are some of the most common misconceptions about MSG that you feel passionate about debunking? And then why does it get hate? <laughs> I knew this question was coming. And, you know, if you're at all familiar with the topic, this won't be any surprise. But if you're new, you might have only really heard of it in terms of being bad for you. You know, for lack of a better word, people will call it a poison. They'll say that it's toxic and it comes from a pretty, you know, chaotic history. We'll say originally there wasn't that tension between, you know, the public perception of MSG and the actual ingredient, but, you know, we fast forward to kind of a tumultuous time in American history, and it started as a really xenophobic myth. You'll hear it. Um, this is now a very outdated and non-PC term, but Chinese restaurant syndrome alluded to this idea that eating a meal at a Chinese restaurant, you know, ordering Chinese takeout, eating those dishes that are part of the Chinese diaspora, you know, that would contribute to these unexplainable symptoms, right? Like intense headaches, you know, grogginess, feeling lethargic, um, mind fog, you know, it kind of runs the same script as what you hear a lot of the wellness influencers now kind of just alluding to these ambiguous symptoms. This was maybe one of the earliest instances of that happening. Um, and it really sparked this, you know, public view of MSG as this thing that is bad for you and should be avoided. And the really interesting intersection of that is obviously the racial and ethnic component. So again, this was in the 1960s. I alluded to that a rather tumultuous time in American history and the xenophobic idea that, you know, Chinese food or East Asian food is so foreign, so unfamiliar, so, you know, just not part of the, the standard diet that the typical American white American might be familiar with at that time. And I think that was just like taking hold in people's mind and we see it trickling down through generations. So if you think of someone who was old enough to kind of move through that logic at that time, you know, at this point they are grandparents. So that belief, whether it was overtly or explicitly said or not, you know, trickled down through their children and then their children's children. And now it is just, you know, kind of part and parcel with this topic of foods that you should avoid. Um, that general idea that MSG is this terrible thing and is strongly associated with Chinese or East Asian cuisines is, is here today. And that's what we see a lot when, when posts come up or whenever we're talking about it, that's like the immediate thing that people jump to is, oh, I thought it was bad for you. And it's like, oh, like, Okay, let's hash this out again. <laughs> that was my experience with it until honestly recently. Like I had only heard the negatives of it, especially related to Chinese food. And so it makes total sense to me that that is such a common misconception. Not that my lived experience is everybody's, but I do feel like that is one that is just so misunderstood, like you said. Right. And I think it should be pointed out, you know, we haven't mentioned it yet, but those so-called unexplainable symptoms really can be explained by the fact that they are not 
linked to MSG. These have never really been replicated in a well-designed and adequately powered clinical trial. Even anecdotally, there's really interesting case studies where, you know, it's kind of like the placebo or nocebo effect where by simply telling someone that MSG is in the food, oh, all of a sudden I feel like I'm experiencing a symptom or we didn't tell you MSG is in the food. How are you feeling? I think that's a really interesting way to kind of think about, you know, just that psychosomatic, you know, reaction. If you, you know, take any substance that could strike fear into you prior to eating, it's like, yeah, that really does change your perception of how you physically and emotionally feel. Um, but it should be stated that, you know, again, when we have a well-designed methodology in a clinical trial, something that is, you know, really designed to try to investigate that hypothesis and follow the scientific method that just has not been reproduced. And those symptoms really are not linked to the consumption of MSG at a level that would be realistic out in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like headaches, migraines are definitely one that I hear a lot. The other one I'm curious to ask you about is, um, being allergic to it. So I hear a lot and I'm sure you do too, Kara, my gosh, is, oh, I can't have MSG because I'm allergic to it. It causes like an allergic reaction. What, what's going on there when someone says that? Yeah. Well, I first want to be really compassionate for anyone who does have food allergies or sensitivities of any kind. I've said this before in a, a video that I posted where, you know, this is frustrating. It's expensive. It is inconvenient. Like to have to live with a food allergy or a food sensitivity is not fun. I think we would all agree that if we had the choice to avoid that discomfort and all the inconveniences, like, yeah, I, I really think most people would. At the same time, because we have this heightened awareness of allergies and sensitivities to food, that's much more a part of the common vernacular and the conversation than that used to be. So because of that heightened awareness, it's almost, you know, I don't want to, you know, kind of brush this off or sound like very cavalier about it, but it's a really easy way to avoid a line of questioning when somebody's like, oh, well, why don't you want something? Don't you want to try this? And you say, no, thank you. I'm allergic or I can't because I'm allergic. And I have a hunch, you know, again, this is just my personal and professional opinion that because of that strong negative perception of MSG and a desire to avoid it out of, again, a, a strong motivation to just take care of your body and treat it well by saying I'm allergic to it. Again, you, you kind of have that pass of saying, well, that's my reasoning for avoiding something with MSG. However, <laughs> At the same time, it is really important to distinguish between a true allergen and something that may elicit symptoms because of a sensitivity or an intolerance. So when we go back to that idea of an allergen, that's going to be an immune mediated reaction to the presence of a specific protein. So that, you know, could be your dairy allergy, your egg allergy, um, soy allergies. You know, there's many, many possibilities for allergies because of the proteins that are, are found in foods. If we flip that over and, you know, go back to our MSG molecule, if you remember earlier when we said it's just that single sodium attached to a glutamate. Well, it's true that glutamate as an amino acid is a component of a protein structure. We call them the building blocks of protein for a reason. So many proteins, you know, it's the most common amino acid out there are going to have that glutamate molecule, but that does not mean that the individual glutamate molecule found in MSG is going to bring forth that immune response, like an allergy. So that's a pretty, you know, pretty medicalized explanation. And I think to the average person, when it really comes down to it and they're experiencing a symptom, it may appear the same, whether it's a, a sensitivity or an allergy. And I really truly don't think it matters much at that point. The reality and the truth of the matter is that they are experiencing something that they wish to avoid. Again, it's uncomfortable, can even be potentially life-threatening, very, very serious when it comes to allergens. But the fact remains that there is no true MSG allergy Again, when we start getting into sensitivities and intolerances, we also have to kind of question, well, what is it? There is almost an infinite number of triggers for something like, say, a migraine. And even for the same person in their same body, those triggers may vary depending on environmental triggers or other stressors that you know, they come into contact with. So it just gets really, really dicey to try to pinpoint the blame squarely on 
MSG alone, when it may be a combination of factors or a different factor that elicit those symptoms. What a, I, I appreciate that response very much. I feel like you did a very good job of covering all aspects of it. And we love also the medical side of it. Hannah and I don't go too much into the biology and chemistry of nutrition super frequently. So it was a fun, a fun flashback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, I feel like, yeah, I feel like I don't have anything to add about that besides potentially now that we've kind of talked about like what MSG is, where it might appear, discussing the reasonings for the misconceptions around it potentially, and some also like just misconceptions about what it can cause in general. If people are new to using MSG and, or have never used it at all, and they want to introduce it into some of their home cooking, how would you recommend they start? Like maybe, I don't know if you have specific things in mind, like different items in general, when to add it, anything like that. Absolutely. I love answering this question. I'd say it's probably the second most common question I get behind, obviously, is it safe or am I allergic? That type of thing. And I love anybody who wants to start using it or is unfamiliar because it's like, I am about to just blow your mind. Your food is about to instantly start tasting so much better. And again, with a lot of other ingredients, it can be really intimidating. You think, oh, I need to precisely measure if I add it at the wrong time, it's not going to work. And the really great thing about cooking with MSG is you don't have to worry about any of that. When it says in a recipe to add salt or when you're serving a dish, a lot of recipes will say salt to taste. You can literally exchange MSG for table salt in nearly a one for one exchange. The difference is, you know, again, MSG is pure umami. It's going to be that savory flavor. It will have a level of saltiness with, with added depth to flavor. So if you're doing that exchange, what you might miss out is like, Hey, this feels Somehow still a little bit salty, but with a little something extra, I do still want a little extra salt. So I tell people, you know, you can always start by adding about half and then give it a taste, see what you think. You can always add more, but if you're making something like a stir fry or a rice dish or a soup or a stew, you know, once it's in there, you're not getting it back out. So kind of go into it a little bit cautious, taste along the way. And um, what I sometimes recommend to people who are brand new to it is like, Hey, if you're going to go out and make this purchase, it's not very expensive. You may need to find it online or in an Asian grocer or market near you. They usually will carry it in like a big, just bulk bag near the spices and other seasonings. And what I'll tell people to do is try a 50, 50 blend. So, you know, if you've got your salt shaker or a spice dish or, you know, the salt cellar type thing, if you just swap out half of the sodium or the table salt for MSG, you're going to have a couple of benefits. Like obviously the taste is really going to shift. Um, but I alluded to that sodium piece because monosodium glutamate, because it's lower in sodium than table salt, you'll actually have a better way of controlling how much sodium ends up in the food you cook at home. So I think when it comes from a, you know, health perspective, that's another thing that, you know, people aren't really considering is like, Hey, I'm used to this very salty flavor when I'm cooking with my food, I might add salt before, during, or after cooking. It's like, you can do that exact same thing with MSG, add it before, during, or after cooking. And not only is that flavor going to be enhanced, but you've also cut the sodium in that finished dish. I just realized I'd never really seen, I don't think MSG, like in a written recipe before. So I really like in my blog, (laughs) do you, you put it in your recipes? I'm sure you do. I do. Yes. I started doing that recently because while that was, you know, obviously how we've been cooking for a long time, I said the same thing. I was like, okay, if I go online and I'm looking for recipes, you know, there's a really great resource called nomsg.com and you'll find more about, you know, the science, obviously the history, things like that. And they do have some recipes in their archives there, but Beyond that, I mean, we have content creators on YouTube and TikTok now who are very vocal and open about cooking with MSG, but I agree. I think it's still relatively rare to see like a written recipe that calls for that in the ingredient list. So just in an effort to kind of normalize it and also be 
fully transparent and say, this is how I made this recipe and testing and eating it myself, you know, putting MSG in there, I think is, is great. And it's honestly, whatever you're picturing an amount of MSG being, it's probably less than that. I don't know how this would mark it all at all. And this is not at all probably helpful to the listeners, but I have a request, Kara, because I know you're very good at recipe development and your website is very pretty to look at. I don't know. This is, this is on me for not knowing. I don't know if you have a cookbook. Do you have a cookbook? Okay. You do. I'm going to, I'm going to assume it's not what I'm thinking, but I was going to say you should make an MSG <laughs> fill or like MSG loving cookbook. And it's just all different ways to incorporate MSG in different dis- dishes. I feel like that would be so fun. I, would I love that, that idea. And I mean, really a variety of recipes. I mean, again, anything that calls for salt. I mean, I've even seen instances where chefs have used it in sweet recipes, you know, mm-hmm. dessert recipes with ice cream, um, oh. brownies. It is fascinating because even to me, that was a new use. I tended to say, you know, use it for anything savory, you know, or grilled meats, roasted vegetables, soups and stews, sauces, all the rest. And then I started thinking about it and I was like, well, there are instances of more savory desserts. There are desserts that you don't want to have overly sweet. There's salted caramel. There's, you know, flaky mm-hmm. sea salt on top of brownies. And, you know, if you're open to experimenting with that, I think it'd be great, but no, you're absolutely right. My earlier cookbooks came at a time when, you know, my recipe development process looked quite different. My whole branding and sort of online persona looked really different. So I would love to go back and redo it again. If there are any, you know, cookbook editors in the audience listening, you know, hook me up with your publisher, because that is something I would, I would love to do just again, to normalize it and help people realize like the key to better home cooking or eating meals at home that you're genuinely excited about and want to eat. Like it could be as simple as just adding like a sprinkle of MSG. I love That's that. so exciting that that can go such a far way. Yeah. Cool. I feel like I'm going to start doing that because I myself have never cooked with it. So I'm like taking notes. Like I'm so excited about this. This is great. <laughs> yeah. One last recommendation I can offer to it's behind me in the kitchen right now, but we actually use it in a spice blend with other seasonings. So mm-hmm. again, if you're not used to always salting your food at the table, or you just don't cook with a lot of table salt in general, another way to you know experiment with it is to think of like a salt-free seasoning blend. You know, it's going to maybe have granulated or, you know, powdered garlic. It might have onion flakes, might have sesame seeds, black pepper, almost like a steak seasoning. Um, Again, you may even start with a store-bought steak seasoning, get a salt-free one, and then add maybe a teaspoon or two, or kind of adjust the ratios to whatever amount you're using and try it that way. You know, we put it on top of like an herb sprinkle for salads, or if we do like a frozen pizza at home. Um, we love Penzi's. Not all areas have a, a spice store like that. Um, but if you're using anything store-bought, you know, you can always jazz it up a little bit at home and really make it your own. And the one that we use is called Jets Blend, which is <laughs> just a nickname that my partner had. And so we're always saying like, where's Jets Blend? Like it needs more Jets Blend. So that's how we use it a lot too. Oh, that's a good idea. I feel like that'd be really a really great idea once you especially figure out kind of the process of how much. Um, but I'm sure also too, in, for the beginners, it sounds like that can't even be helpful for them because you can kind of have other things there to kind of cushion it a little bit. So it's not just straight MSG you're adding to your dishes where it is maybe a little too strong at first if you're not used to knowing how much. Yeah. I mean, your taste buds are not going to steer you wrong because that's another really Mm -hmm. beautiful thing about just mother nature and the whole biological design of things. It's kind of self-limiting and, you know, we're going to detect a level that is quote unquote too much. So if you do accidentally get a little heavy handed with it, give it a taste and realize, wow, I really can't taste much else at that point, you know, you may be able to dilute it with some other things and you'll just know for next time, kind of what that upper threshold is. 
But when it comes back to the safety piece of it, you know, there's no amount that we're going to realistically consume, whether through naturally occurring sources of, of MSG or things that are added or in processed foods that are going to rise above a, a threshold of safety. So again, it's self-limiting in the sense that if you err into that territory of quote unquote too much, it's not going to taste good anymore. It's going to be so unappetizing that you're probably not going to keep eating that food that tastes unappetizing. And when we compare that against some of the, the cuisine styles and um, areas that consume the most MSG, you know, our Japanese cuisine, our Korean cuisine, even in those very high consumption types of, of cuisines, they're not getting anything close to that. Like the average amount of a free glutamate or MSG that you're getting is again, well within the confines of the safety limit. I, I'm sure that applies to so many, so many foods and ingredients. And that just goes back to the whole wellness culture thing of, oh, it's toxic, it's poisonous. And you just cannot call a food or ingredient that without saying the dosage there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have such a bone to pick too, with, you know, again, going back to that list of foods where it's so naturally occurring. So, you know, prominent in tomatoes, mushrooms, mm -hmm. Parmesan cheese, it's like, let's think of some other cuisines and ethnic groups that feature that really heavily in their cooking. And it's like Italy, Italian cuisine, Mediterranean diet. And it, it again comes back to the really interesting and, and often problematic intersection of the xenophobia and the bias towards a very Eurocentric or European style diet. When mm -hmm. that carries over into what is now, you know, American cuisine, we tend to favor or view those types of cuisines more favorably, not just for acceptance and familiarity, but also, you know, when it comes to the health accolades, like the Mediterranean diet is one of the most heavily studied diets in the world. There's a lot of funding and, you know, a lot of interest in really validating that this is a healthy pattern of eating. And like we have, right? Like it's almost common knowledge at this point that the Mediterranean style diet is a generally healthy diet when it comes to well-being and long-term disease risk management, all of that great stuff. Yet at the same time, we can shift our focus to other regions of the world and say, yes, it's different. These are ingredients that are less familiar to someone who's accustomed to that very Eurocentric eating pattern. Doesn't mean that it's worse and in some ways can be just as good or better. Yes. A lot of, I feel like Mediterranean style foods are ones that are very Eurocentric already, like things that people like me are already eating. And so it does just feel a lot more familiar versus maybe more like Korean type dishes or J Japanese type dishes. Like you said, they might have very similar ingredients or like the MSG compound in certain things, but because they're not foods that we're eating on a regular basis, it doesn't get all the glorification that the Mediterranean diet does. Right. So, you know, if you're listening to this and, you know, maybe hearing that for the first time, it's not to say that you're wrong or bad for harboring that same belief. It's kind of like, well, until you know better, there's really no difference. Like you're, you're not able to really shift your, your frame of mind around that until you're exposed to something new. But mm -hmm. this is why I love talking about this topic so much because it is so common for me to get a comment from somebody on a post or in a conversation that's like, well, I didn't know that it was connected to this problematic racist myth, or I didn't know that it was you know, linked to quote unquote, Chinese restaurant syndrome. And it's like, well, yeah, this is why we're so vocal about it and being so loud about the fact that we're trying to not only reverse and unwind decades old myths about the ingredient, but it's also standing up for Chinese restaurant owners, immigrant families who have started a small business in America. You know, it does become really personal because I'm mixed race, you know, my Korean side of the family is going to be cooking with that. Traditional Korean recipes are going to have very high umami ingredients. You know, that's something that's really near and dear to my heart. So to, to see it framed in such a negative way, it's like, yeah, there's the scientific side, the professional or medical side, but in reality, that myth is really most harmful to those families, to those, you know, restaurant owners, the people who really cherish those cuisine styles. Um, so it is important to, to speak to both pieces of it and at some point along the way, you know, a light bulb is going to go off in the mind of someone who hasn't questioned it before and been like, hmm, like I am maybe going to rethink that next time I regurgitate this myth that got passed down from my, you know, mom's cousins, 
in-laws, whatever. <laughs> it's always like at least three degrees of separation. And I'm like, hmm, let me talk to them and we'll see how their symptoms really came up. But, you know, I think that's, again, one of the things that, you know, people don't really pause the question. If, you know, it comes from a trusted source or someone that's, you know, an immediate family member, someone, you know, who, who you've always had, you know, reason to trust and believe it's sort of like, you maybe would not question it quite as extensively. So having those conversations can sometimes get a little bit heated, you know, especially on social media, we don't always have the benefit of picking up tone or intention, but I find in face-to-face -face conversations, especially that's where you can really kind of unpack, like, what are your concerns? Like, let's talk about them. And like, the last thing I'll say about it is at the end of the day, even with all of that new or different information and the reassurance that it is safe, if someone says they don't want to eat it or they still want to avoid it and not use it, great. No harm, no foul. The only thing I would ask is next time you hear that myth, you'll be armed with some of that information to push back against it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Cause like we're all, we we're, we're big advocates of critical thinking on the Upbeat Dietitians podcast. And like at the end of the day, you can eat whatever you want to eat. You could, you don't have to eat things you don't want to eat. Um, but what is driving a lot of the misconceptions around it is really important that it is addressed. Um, and it's perfectly fine to say you don't want to eat it because you don't want to eat it, but kind of, it's like, why? And having that conversation more is really important because it is, a, it is so much, it's like such a, a part of such a bigger picture than just like headaches and this biochemical makeup. It's a lot uh, of like, it's affecting races of people and families, businesses, and it's very harmful. And I feel like in wellness culture, it's, it's very easy for like them to just target I don't know if I want to say like, just like making, like pulling from like some types of like, how do I want to say this? I don't know if I want, I don't know if misconceptions is the right word, but it's like maybe like preconceived notions about like what you think and like what is normal and what's normalized, especially in the diet culture space and kind of weaponizing that to scare people about things. Oh, absolutely. We've all seen those videos of a shirtless guy in the grocery store screaming about the ingredients in this processed food. And I mean, I think most people can recognize that as being problematic in a number of ways. Yet at the same time, it goes viral for a reason, right? Like those fear tactics and the emotional response that, you know, that dredges up in you. We remember that a lot more than data and science and PubMed links. So, you know, we have to find a way to kind of tell that story differently. You know, excitement is another emotion. Like if I can help you feel excited about cooking at home or excited about really delicious food, can that potentially outweigh the fear or whatever, like little seed has been planted in your mind by the guy without a shirt screaming in the grocery store? <laughs> I love that though, like using yes. just a different strong emotion for our marketing instead of fear because fear does sell, but because yes. it is a strong emotion, there are other emotions that we can, we can use instead to promote more evidence-based information, hopefully. Right. And, you know, Emily, I'll go back to what you said earlier too, about you don't have to eat what you don't want to eat. I will mm -hmm. always stand behind somebody who says, I just don't like it. And taste preferences, you know, we can't emphasize that enough. Like your taste preferences should be one of the strongest drivers about what you do or don't eat. I personally really, really gravitate towards savory umami flavored foods. That's probably very obvious at this point. At the same time, I have clients and, you know, different folks that I know who will be like, I have a major sweet tooth. I love sweet flavors. I love sour, tart, juicy flavors. Like, yes, we have those five basic senses or tastes that our tongue can pick up on. But when we think about the actual eating experience, our taste preferences go beyond just five basic flavors, we can think about texture, we can think about temperature, we can think about 
cooking method and preparation style and appearance and what it looks like on our plate or in our bowl. And all of those can be driven by obviously not just the presence of a single ingredient like MSG, but kind of the overall, you know, zoomed out experience of what that bite is going to be. And if somebody comes back and they're like, I just don't like it. Great. Who am I to argue about what you like or don't like? Again, the only thing we would ask is let's not avoid it out of fear or misunderstanding. I always coach on, you know, being able to make really informed and empowered decisions so that you feel confident when you're cooking or eating. Um, and this really falls under that umbrella of just having enough information and experience with something to decide for yourself, whether it's for you or whether it's not. And of course, to not spreading that misinformation to others, whether it's your kids or partners or on social media, if you are someone who talked about that on social media. So not only making your own informed choices for feeding yourself, but if you are responsible for helping feed others, not spreading that information on them too. Mm -hmm. And actually that's been one of the surprising things that's been happening lately is, you know, if I'm talking about it online or in these digital spaces, more often than not, people are rising to the defense of MSG. Like they're conversing amongst themselves in the comments and replying to one another or citing, you know, some of the data that's out there. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to link in the show notes if, if anybody does want to access that, but it's almost a hands-off thing. Like sometimes I'll post and even just sort of wait and see. And I would say that shift has hap happened more recently. You know, in the past it was like, oh, brace yourself. Like the, the trolls are about to come out. And now it's kind of nice. Like it's usually going to pass the vibe check or at the very least, if one of those trolling comments does make its way in there, there's somebody else who, you know, may or may not know me personally or is familiar who's hopping in and saying like hey look this really isn't backed up it is unscientific you can't be allergic to it it's not toxic and I love it I love it when that happens that is like the most refreshing experience and it's kind of like if it is someone that you know is like a go-to in your community it's like a mama bear moment almost like if you were the one who hopefully taught them some great information it's like oh I'm just so proud of you for being in my comments supporting me that's just so wonderful <laughs> Yes. Yes. You've been, you've been listening. You heard what I said. Yes. You remember it. And now you're, you're saying it yourself. So yeah, that does feel good because I know there are a lot of people who are not nearly as chronically online as we are. Um, and at the same time, I know there's a lot of people who are online a lot, but don't necessarily engage. Like people will see posts. They don't always jump in and comment. Um, but it is a nice sign that, you know, Hey, people are seeing it. People are, are listening or reading. Um, and I hope, you know, for this audience too, if you're listening to this episode, you know, kind of rethinking too, like just staying skeptical, like applying that critical thinking. I am also a huge, huge fan of critical thinking and just like pausing, like we're very quick to jump to assumptions, especially with food. Like we all eat. So we all have some level of inherent body wisdom and experience and, and all the, the good stuff there. But when we hear something that's like, mm, that doesn't sound quite right. You know, just taking that pause and, and thinking a little bit more before you jump straight into, you know, reserving it in long-term memory or perpetuating problematic myths. Cool. Well, I feel like we did a very good job of covering all things MSG. Um, I'm sure there's more that can probably be said, but go definitely check out Kara's. We're, we're going to allow you to market yourself <laughs> in a second, but definitely go check out Kara's content because there's a lot of good videos on there about MSG and resources. Do you have any last, any last thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap up this? The episode? only thing that I will add is if you're going to be ordering online, one of the things that my clients have loved just because it makes cooking a little bit more fun is like you can get MSG just in a bulk bag or a giant canister, but I have to give a little shout out to my Panda shaker. I feature that in a lot of videos and it never fails. Someone's like, Oh, the Panda shaker is there. Or like I got my own Panda shaker. So Ajinomoto is one of the manufacturers of MSG and they do have like a little salt shaker. It is more expensive. I will admit to buy the MSG that way, but I will put a little plug in there and just say, get one, buy it once. And then if you decide you like it, just keep refilling it. That can be a really economical way to keep doing it because at my local Korean market, I think I can get a 
you know, one pound bag, which is a lot of MSG, you know, when you're using a quarter of a teaspoon at a time, a one pound bag is going to last you quite a while. You know, something like that is only going to run a few bucks. So in the big scheme of things, when we're comparing it to other things that add flavor um, to our food, to our meal, um, it really is relatively inexpensive. And again, it can just be, you know, that much more fun or delightful when you're in there and you are seasoning your food and you can grab, you know, your cute little panda shaker. I was hoping you'd bring that up because it is just like the cutest thing in the world. And I actually need to get one myself. It is so adorable. I, I highly recommend it. Yes. <laughs> um, if you will make sure to link that in the show notes too. So you can also get your own little painter maker. Cause I'm feeling also very influenced right now. I'm so influenced. I, yeah. we love cute things. So <laughs> we're all about that. Cool. Well, Kara, oh wait, no. Okay. We're not done. We're not done. Let if people want to hear more from you. Where can they find you? Um, we are, you already mentioned you also have a cookbook so they can buy your cookbook. Feel free to share. If anyone wants to hear more from you though, where can they find um, you at? I'm everywhere. <laughs> so all the socials, you know, Instagram, TikTok, threads, not so much Twitter anymore. Facebook, Pinterest. And then of course my blog is streetsmartnutrition.com. That's where you're going to find, you know, mostly recipes at this point, but still a lot of topics and articles around intuitive eating and gentle nutrition. I'm also going to be reviving a newsletter in 2024. So you can get in early to kind of catch, you know, that growing email newsletter content form. Um, and then one of the newest things that I've been doing lately is YouTube. So, you know, obviously a lot of you know, just reusing the same videos in short form. But if you're interested in more nuanced and in-depth conversations about some of these topics, I really want to be doing more of that on YouTube and connect with you there because again, we just know that attention spans are so short. I know most people only have a tolerance for like a not even 10 second long video. If you would like a 10 minute long video, come see me on YouTube. It's awesome. We definitely will link all those yeah. below and Kara, thank you again for coming back on. We had a great time, our first conversation, even though I feel like we've really done a 180. We went from like intuitive eating and sports nutrition to MSG. You are just like a jack of all trades, but our listeners are going to love this. So thank you again for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cool. Well, tune in next week, guys. And if you want to listen to Kara's answer to our bonus question, you'll have to check out the beat deets for this week. Otherwise, we'll catch you next week. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in on this episode of The Upbeat Dietitians with your host, Emily Krause and Hannah Thompson. We appreciate you all so much for continuing to support us. In order to support us and sustain the success of this podcast, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. If you'd like to provide us feedback for future episodes and guest stars, follow us on Instagram at The Upbeat Dietitians. Lastly, you can show us support by providing a monthly donation using the link at the end of our bio. Once again, thank you so much for listening today and stay tuned next Wednesday for a new episode. Until then, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.